Good morning, everybody. We've got uh, quite a few people battling illness today and are out, and so our prayers are with all of them. If you guys are watching online right now, we're praying for you and missing you this morning. If you're watching online from anywhere else, uh, we're glad that you took time to be with us and hope that you will use the, the comment section in our live feed to engage with us. We'd love to know more about what you think and if you have any questions about the lesson. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we are especially grateful for you. You are our honored guests. I hope you will uh, stick around just a few minutes afterwards so we can get to know you a little bit better and find out how we might be able to better serve your family. We're going to continue a series that we started a couple weeks ago, walking through the story of the Exodus and asking the question, who is God? And we're going to discover God's love embedded in the story of the Exodus, but specifically in three chapters towards the end of Exodus, in Exodus chapters 32 through 34. And so two weeks ago, I introduced this series by talking about kind of the grander narrative of the story of Exodus, what leads up to what happens in these three chapters. This morning, we're going to tackle Exodus chapter 32 and want to encourage you to open up your Bibles or your Bible app or whatever it is you have access to to Exodus chapter 32, where we're going to be taking our lesson this morning. While you're turning there, quickly, if I just make one more announcement. This coming Wednesday evening, we've got something special planned. Uh, David Shannon, who is the current president of Freed Hardeman University, a Christian university in Tennessee, happens to be my alma mater. Uh, He's going to be in Southern California, and so he's going to join us for class on Wednesday, and he's going to give us a, a lesson or a class talking about uh, the value of Christian education, but also talking about the need to build stronger uh, intergenerational relationships and talking about Paul and Timothy's relationship as kind of a, a lens into all that. And so I want to strongly encourage you, if you're not normally a part of our Wednesday evening lessons, to either join us online or in person here at the building starting at 7 o'clock uh, for that. That's going to be a special treat for us. And I think especially parents of young people, if you've got... Um, middle school or high school age kids, I think you will find this especially beneficial. And so I hope you will make plans to be a part of that this coming Wednesday. So Exodus chapter 32. Let's go ahead and get into our lesson this morning. Let me turn this on so it works. There we go. Okay, so Exodus chapter 19 verses 7 and 8 is something we talked about last week. But if you remember, I encouraged you to think about the whole saga in Exodus it's kind of a, 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 a physical marriage relationship, how God is courting Israel, God proposes to Israel, and then God enters into marriage with Israel. And that might seem like a, a strange way to think about God's relationship with his covenant people, but that's using God's own language. He uses that marriage analogy to help us better understand the relationship he has with his people. And in Exodus chapter 19, he is proposing, as it were, talking about the terms for his covenant that he wants to enter into. Into with his people. And so Moses takes this proposal to the people, and their response is as follows. It says, So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And so as you read that story, what you're expecting then is to see Israel enter into covenant faithfulness with God. But what we find is the exact Opposite, And so that leads us to what transpires in chapter 32. And as we get to chapter 32, what we find is something very surprising. And let me just set the stage for you. A few things are happening. Number one, Moses has been gone for too long. He's up on top of the mountain, a mountain that's consumed with fire and smoke. And if you remember, we talked about it last week in Exodus 24 and verse 18. Anybody remember how long was Moses on the mountain? Forty days and forty nights. And for them, that's just too long. He's gone too long. They don't know what's happened to him, and they're starting to panic. Number two, they're asking the question, where is the evidence that God is still present? How do we know that he's still here? He's been working through us, but through his representative Moses, he's gone. Maybe God has gone with him. And so they're wondering where the presence of God is. And finally, just to put it in perspective, they're leaderless. They're directionless. Remember, they're at the base of this mountain in the middle of the the Sinai wilderness. They have no idea where they're going, and they're hopeless. And so this is their situation as it stands when we start in Exodus chapter 32. And so the question is, what now? How are they going to react? What are they going to do now that they find themselves in this situation? And so that brings us to the first portion of Scripture. And I've broken the chapter down into four sections to help us better understand this. Number one is the breaking of the covenant. 
And it's the first six verses. So if you follow along with me, Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and bought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink. And they rose up to play. God's plan has been all the time through Scripture. And we see this plan articulated over and over again for him to work through a covenant people. He calls Abraham, tells Abraham he's going to bless him. And through the blessing of his descendants, God is going to, in turn, if you remember back in Genesis 12, what did he tell Abraham? You're going to be blessed, but through you, what? All the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so God's plan from the beginning has been to work through a covenant people so that the whole world may be blessed because of them. But right away in chapter 32, we run into a massive problem. And what is the problem? The problem is simply this. God's people are unfaithful to him from the very moment that they enter into this covenant with him. They tell him unequivocally, we will do everything God has told us. We're going to be faithful to this covenant. And yet while Moses is up on the mountain receiving the terms of the covenant, they're at the base of the mountain doing what? Creating an idol. They're falling into unfaithfulness from the very beginning. And this is the story of God's people. And this presents really kind of the heart of the narrative of the rest of the Old Testament Scriptures. What is God going to do if He wants to save a world through a covenant people when those people aren't faithful to Him? And I just I want you to think about this imagery for a minute. Can you imagine a wedding like this? Where the bride is committing adultery during the wedding ceremony while the groom is reading the vows. Because that's essentially what's happening here. And so what is God going to do as a result of all of this? How is he going to react? That's the question that these three chapters are trying to get us to understand. And all of it is built off of this singular event, the building of this golden calf, Israel's desire to fall into idol worship right from the very beginning. This is Israel's collective Genesis 3 moment. What do I mean by that? What happened in Genesis 3? The serpent deceives Eve and in in turn deceives Adam, right? And we look at that and a lot of times I think we disassociate ourselves from that moment. We realize that we all live in a world that's broken because of their sin, but if it had been us there, we wouldn't have done that, obviously, right? We would have been smart enough to turn away the serpent. But Israel, in their humility, looked back at this moment and they saw it as their Genesis 3 moment. This is the moment when they collectively, as a people rebelled against their God and turned against Him. Israel is always wrestling with God. You remember Genesis chapter 32 when Jacob gets a new name? How does he get that name? Because he wrestles all night with a man, right? Except that man turns out to be God in some way, shape, or form. And so after demanding that he blesses him, God in turn gives him a new name. The name is Israel. And you remember what it means? Striving with God. Israel is always wrestling with God. And here they're wrestling again with God from the very beginning. We will be faithful. But then they build this golden calf. And so how is God going to react in the midst of the unfaithfulness of his covenant people? Why did they build the golden calf to begin with? It's a question that we've got to wrestle with in this text. Like, I understand that they're being unfaithful, but why were they unfaithful in this way? What possessed them to think we need to build a golden cow? Now, later on, Aaron's going to give a really lame excuse. Do you remember what his excuse is? We just threw it in the fire and out popped the cow, right? But it didn't happen like that. Aaron fashioned it into that form. What is the reason behind this? Now, a couple things. Number one, we know that 
cows and specifically bulls were a very common way to represent gods in the ancient Near Eastern world that the Israelites found themselves in, especially among the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And so they were familiar with people using cows to represent deity. Bulls had all of these different characteristics that people thought were divine in nature, and so they used the image of the cow in order to represent the power of their deity. And it's not like the cow itself was the god they were worshiping but it represented the power of the God that they were worshiping. And a lot of time you find cows, and specifically bulls, used as kind of the footstool or the altar or the throne of the God that rested upon them. And so the question is, what was Israel doing? Were they using that imagery and borrowing from it in order to replace Yahweh? In other words, we need to build a different God because Yahweh has somehow abandoned us in this moment? Or are they simply looking for a way to to represent Yahweh? Which is it? Have they replaced him? Or are they just building an image so that they can represent him because they can't see him? They need something in front of them to prove that he's there. Either way, either way, what they're doing is engaging in idolatry. And if you're wondering, you know, what is the correct answer? I don't know. The text, I think, makes either one plausible. If you'll notice the vocabulary here, they, Aaron makes this, this golden calf, and it's just one, but what do the people say? These are your gods, plural, right? So have they replaced Yahweh with a multiplicity of gods? Well, later on, there's other places where it talks about it in a singular form. For example, Nehemiah chapter 9 that was just read for us, it refers back to that moment and talks about it in the singular. So I don't know exactly what they're doing, but if you look at verse... Um, Five, it says, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. The indication there seems to be that this God was actually a representation of Yahweh himself. So which is worse, and which are they guilty of? Well, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, because no matter what they were doing, whether they were replacing God or just trying to create an image of God, either way, it's idolatry. Look at Exodus chapter 20, if you would. Exodus chapter 20, of course, this is the chapter where they're given the Ten Commandments, right? And I want you to pay attention to the first and the second commandment. Exodus chapter 20 opens this way, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. So if Israel created that calf in order to replace Yahweh... Are they guilty of breaking that commandment? Absolutely. But then look at commandment number two. Verse four here. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You don't get to replace me, and you don't get to turn me into an image, because that's not the God I am. God doesn't want to be replaced, and he doesn't want to be worshipped the way that other deities are worshipped. So regardless of what Israel is doing, whether they're replacing him or borrowing from other cultures so that they can worship their God the way these other people worship God, either way, either way, they are breaking the commandments God gave them, and they're worshipping him on their terms. And when you think about this, this is still the way that people struggle through their relationship with their creator even yet today. You've got three options laid out here in this chapter. Option number one, you replace Yahweh with an idol. People still guilty of that today? Is idol worship still rampant in our culture today? The temptation, I think, is to say no because we think of idols and we think of like this, actual golden calves, right? Household idols, There are people, I'm sure, who still have those, but you look at our culture today in Southern California, that's not commonplace, and so it might be tempting to say, yeah, idol worship isn't a thing, but it absolutely is a thing today. We are embedded in idolatry in the world that we live in today. We may have discarded the calf, but we have held on to that gold, haven't we? There is always the temptation to take something and put it in the place of the Creator and worship that thing. That's option number one. We can replace Yahweh and fall down at the feet of an an idol. 
Option number two is we can just rework Yahweh into an image of our own making, and so we're going to turn him into a golden calf, because that's the way other people worship him. Or we're going to take what we know about God the Creator, and we're going to mold him into our own image so that we can worship him on our own terms. Also, displeasing to God. Or option number three, which is what? We're faithful to the covenant that he's made with us, and we worship him knowing who he is on his terms. That's the option I hope we choose, but Israel chose one of the previous two. And so regardless of what they're doing here, they are engaging in idolatry. Okay, so the second section now is about God's reaction. This is what Israel does How is God going to react? And all three of these chapters are answering this question. How will God react to a people this unfaithful to him from the very beginning? And so if you would follow along with me, verses 7 through 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. You catch that? (laughs) Did you catch that? What does God tell Moses? The Lord said to Moses, go down for, what does he say? Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They suddenly, the language changes, right? Now that they're unfaithful, they're, they're Moses' people, right? Parents, have you ever done this? Right? You see your child being naughty, and suddenly it's your spouse's child. You know what I'm saying, right? Okay. You need to go deal with your daughter right now. Hmm? I tell Robin that sometimes, right? Because I see glimpses of Robin and Paisley. Say, your daughter just did this thing, right? This is what God's doing. Like, these are your people. These unfaithful people. These are your people because my covenant people wouldn't do this. It's just an interesting thing that God does there. But he says, you need to go deal with this situation because your people are corrupting themselves. Verse 8, they have turned aside quickly right out of the bat. They have turned right out of the gate. They have turned aside quickly out of the way I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. And that may I, I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you. This is God's initial reaction to Israel's unfaithfulness. He's going to do like the flood 2.0. He's going to destroy the people and start over again with one man, Moses. Let me alone. Let me burn in my anger and let me take my wrath out on them. I'm going to destroy them and I'm going to start over with you, Moses. Of course, if that's the end of the story, this doesn't make for really great reading, does it? But that's not the end of the story. This is just the beginning of the way that God reacts to their unfaithfulness here. But it's a terrifying reaction to think about God's anger burning that hot against our unfaithfulness. But the story continues to unfold. That's God's initial reaction. What happens next now, section 3, is that Moses intercedes on behalf of the people. Moses is going to get involved in this story. And this is what I find to be the most interesting part of this story because God is allowing Moses to have a part in this conversation about how God is going to deal with the unfaithfulness of his covenant people. This isn't the first time God has done this. But if we're, caref- if we're not careful, we end up reading something into this that's not there. It's tempting for some people to read this and they think, okay, here's what we've got. We've got a temperamental and fickle God And then you've got a level-headed and calm Moses. And Moses is talking some sense into this fickle God. And that is not what is happening here. Think about the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God makes Abraham privy to his plans. And you remember Abraham's first reaction was what? Well, you can't do that. There's faithful people there. What if I find this many faithful people? What if I find this many faithful people? What if I find this many faithful people? And ultimately, Abraham learned how corrupt those people were and was able to see from God's perspective what it looks like to see justice play out in a corrupt world. And I think something similar is happening here where God is allowing Moses to be a part of God's mindset, God's thinking process. He's welcoming him into a partnership with God as he rules over his people. Moses, I want you to understand what this looks like from my perspective. But along the way, Moses is interceding. And so this is what we find in Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 11. 
But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Moses is concerned with optics here. He's saying, God, think about what this would look like to the nations around us if they find out that you brought your people out of Egypt only to do what? Destroy them. What kind of God would that be? What would you look like to the nations around you and why would that make them want to know you more if you're just the God who brought his own people into the wilderness to destroy them? And so Moses makes that argument to God. And he says, turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. This is a remarkable story and one I hope you will take time to wrestle with. God has in mind what he wants to do and then Moses seemingly talks him out of doing that. How very interesting that God even allows Moses the opportunity to do that. But God changes his mind. He's not going to destroy Israel. Moses reminds God of who God is and the promises that God has made and what this means to the nations around them and God relents from what he had intended to do. But I want you to think about Moses in the role of intercessor, making intercession, pleading on behalf of the people. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 13 through 21, you want to maybe mark that down and read it in its full context later on, but Moses later on is reflecting back on this story. And he says, Then I lay prostrate before, prostrate before the Lord as before, forty days and forty nights. So not only is he up on the mountain forty days and forty nights, but now he's laying on the ground forty days and forty nights as he makes this intercession before God. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin that you, Israel, had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure of the Lord that he bore against you, so that he was ready to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. This had a huge impact on Moses, coming to terms with who God is. And that's the whole point of these chapters, is us learning alongside Israel and Moses, who is God in his heart of hearts? Who do we know him to be? And how do we react accordingly? In Psalm 106, and I find it so interesting How many times in Scripture Israel collectively looks back on this moment and they see two things. They see the character of God, but they also recognize the role that Moses played in all of this as intercessor. It says, therefore he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying him. In this psalm, it's the work of Moses as intercessor that the psalmist is focused on. And that's so vitally important Because as we bring this study to a conclusion in a few weeks, we're going to talk more about this, and especially next week, the role that Moses played as intercessor, that someone would stand between sinful us and righteous God and make a plea to God on our behalf that they're still worth saving. This is the role that Moses is playing on Israel's behalf in this moment. And then finally, the last section of the scripture is the longest. And this is where Moses now has an opportunity to react. Remember, as Moses is interceding, he has not seen for himself yet what Israel has really done. He's only been told by God that they've started to fall away. And so he intercedes on their behalf. But now he's going to go down the mountain and see with his own eyes just how corrupt they've become. And in Exodus chapter 32, verses 15 through 29, you read, And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And this is Moses' reaction. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He's gone from pleading on Israel's behalf to furious at Israel now that he's seen it with his own eyes. And this is what I was talking about a minute ago. I think what God is doing is inviting Moses into God's perspective. Moses, once you see just how wicked they have become, you will see from my perspective just how egregious this sin really is. Moses sees it, and he smashes the tablets on the ground. These aren't just 
rock monuments. What do those tablets represent? The covenant God was making with Israel. And Moses is so mad at what he sees, he smashes them in pieces on the ground. Of course, he'll get new ones in a couple chapters, and we'll talk about that. But it says he took the calf that they had made, and he burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water, and he made the people of Israel drink it. And if you want me to explain that to you, I got nothing. (laughs) Other than Moses is really angry, and he really wants them to understand the weight of what they had done. Moses is angry. Now Moses can see from God's perspective just how much corruption had taken root in their hearts right off the bat. We think about all that, right? And by the way, the whole thing ends with a really heartbreaking and terrifying story. Moses asks the question, who is on the Lord's side? And then the Levites say, we are. And they go through the camp and they start to kill their brothers. And we're not given a lot of information. I don't think they went about willy-nilly just killing innocent people. It seems like they put to death the ringleaders of this whole movement until God's wrath is satisfied. And then still at the end, there's some kind of plague that God brings upon the people. And even that's not really illustrated well. We don't know exactly what all the details were. But the point is, even though Moses intercedes and God decides not to destroy them, Israel still pays this enormous price for their sin. There are still ramifications for what they have done. And so we're left at the end of this chapter with one burning question, which is we still want to know how is God ultimately going to react to all of this? He said he's not going to destroy them, but it's clear he is still really angry and there's still a price to be paid. So what's going to happen now? And I'll just leave you with this. It says, the next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord and look at this giant question mark hanging over this whole saga. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Perhaps. Moses still isn't sure who God is. Moses still isn't sure how God's going to react. And Moses still isn't sure what to do about all of this. But he's going to learn in a very powerful way. And so as we get into the next chapters, we're going to continue to try to wrestle with this question. You talk about Israel wrestling with God. We are engaged in a wrestling match with God in these passages. As we come to terms with who is the God that we serve, a God who's full of anger and yet later on says he's slow to anger. How do we make sense out of all of this? And when we, in our own sin, in those quiet moments in our own life, when we are humbly reflecting on our own shortcomings, What do we do about it? How can we react? Do we have the right to reach out to God? Is he so mad he wants nothing to do with us? Or can we approach him somehow? And most importantly, do we have an intercessor willing to stand between us and God pleading on our behalf today? We're going to answer all those questions next week. One last passage, and it's the passage that was read for us before the lesson, just a different section of it. Nehemiah Chapter 9, verses 17 through 19. Israel collectively, right, they, they've rebuilt the temple. They're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. They were carried away into captivity because of their own unfaithfulness by the Babylonians. The Babylonians fall to the Persians, and the Persian kings release them to go back. This is what the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah are all about. And in Ezra, we see primarily a focus on the rebuilding of structures. In Nehemiah, it's structures, but it's also the rebuilding of God's people. There's repentance that needs to take place. There's a turning back to God that still needs to happen in the hearts of the people. And what's remarkable to me is as the people acknowledge their own sinfulness, they take ownership of not just their sins, but the sins of their fathers, which is something we don't like to do today. But Israel took hold of that. And they accepted it as as their own and they repented of it. And they make this statement, reflecting back on the very thing we're reading about in Exodus chapter 2. They say this, but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you did not forsake them. In spite of everything they had done, you did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. 
and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. Who is the God that we serve? He is a God that in spite of our sinfulness will not forsake us. And we're going to learn more about that God over the next two chapters in Exodus chapter 33 and 34. And I hope you'll come back to join us. As we think about what this means in our own walk with God. I talk to so many Christians who, they're still where Moses is now, unsure of how to approach God. Terrified by God's wrath and by God's anger. They know their own sinfulness. Like David talks about in Psalm 51, my sin is always before me. We're, we're very aware of our own shortcomings. What we're not so sure of is how God's going to react to those things. And by walking through this chap- these chapters, I think we, like Israel, can come to terms with who God really is and we can become more sure of our approach towards a gracious, patient, loving God whose mercies know no ends. And so I hope you'll continue on this journey with me. What do you need from that God this morning? Perhaps you're standing here thinking, I want to know that God. I want to know his mercy. I want to know his grace. I want the hope that Israel had that in spite of my own shortcomings, there's still a place for me at God's table. If you want that this morning, let's talk about that more. How you can begin a relationship with God. If you need prayers, if you need encouragement, if you want to study, whatever it is you might need from the church this morning, we stand here to serve. We're going to stand and we're going to sing one more song together. And as we do that, I invite you to come forward and let us know how we might serve you. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, I invite you to grab me or one of our shepherds here this morning. Shepherds, could you raise your hand for me this morning so you know these men stand ready to serve. Grab one of them and they will be happy to pray with you, study with you, encourage you any way you can. Let's stand and let's sing and let us know how we can serve you as you think about these words. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow.